Greetings YouTube. Today I'm going to be talking about the latest Pathfinder book, Ultimate Combat. Yes, the other day I had the fan running and today I'm wearing a flannel shirt. What do I can I say? I live in New England. Now, as the title will probably tell you, Ultimate Combat is all about the martial things in life. Um, Ultimate Magic was all about spellcasting. Ultimate Combat is really heavily focused on fighting. There are spells in the books, however. What gaming book would come out without spells in it? Um, I'm actually going to be flipping through the book a bit in a moment, so I'm just going to go on a page turning to apologize there. But the first thing the book introduces are three new core classes. The Gunslinger, the Ninja, and the Samurai. Now the Gunslinger, as the name implies, is a class that uses firearms, particularly, um, for the most part, muzzle-loading um, gun, uh, Gunpowder-fed weapons, pistols, blunderbuss, muskets, things like that. Um, it's a full bab class, die 10 hit dice. Uh, you get simple martial weapons, proficiency in firearms, of course, and light armor. Um, overall, the thing that stands out the most for the, this class is that you get something called grit points, which are similar to the kinds of points that... Uh, paladins get, the kinds of points that monks get, they're basically allowing you to fuel your character class's abilities. And you can take feats and other things that will increase the number of grit points you have, letting you use your abilities more often. You can spend them in a number of different ways, making you be able to uh, shoot more quickly or more accurately, or buy, essentially, as you gain powers, gain levels, new abilities, which will let you do more damage, uh, and one of the things that I thought was really nice touch in this is that the firearms themselves seem fairly well balanced. But the one thing they gave them is that within the first range increment, and the ranges aren't huge on these things, early firearms weren't the most accurate things in the world. Um, with, but within that first range increment, all of your attacks are touch. So you're going after the touch AC of a target. And to me, that really suits the penetrating ability of a firearm. Yes, people are going to tell me how there were armors out there that did, in fact, deflect rounds. Congratulations. I'm glad. I still like this feature. I think it's a nice mechanical balance to take into account that firearms packed a whole lot of energy in a very small package. I think it was well done. Um... And I think that the fire, the, the gunslinger, the class itself, works well. I haven't played it on free. I just read it. It, it. To me, it seems like it's very well balanced. And yes, realize that I am not a balance guru. I am not. I do not bow too deeply at the at the balance altar. If things kind of ballpark it for me, yeah, that looks good. And I keep going. Um, there are people out there who are probably tell me how broken it is, and I'll just say, okay, if it's broken, don't use it. Um, the next is the Ninja three-quarter bab. You get simple weapons, a number of martial arts style weapons appropriate for um, the Ninja. Um, light armor. Uh, and you get all kinds of abilities that are part and parcel of the classic image that every Westerner is carrying in their head about what a Ninja is. It doesn't matter if it has any relationship to real Ninjas. That is pointless. This is a fantasy game, and this Ninja fits the fantasy game really well. Now, a lot of people are going to say that the ninja and the samurai are going to limit your usefulness because they're Asian. And they are Asian. There is no denying that. But I think you could use both of these classes in a non-Asian environment. You strip the name ninja, slap another name on them, you know, shadow skipper. It doesn't matter what you want to call them. And I think you could use them effectively in a fantasy campaign by just filing the Asian numbers off, okay? Give them some unique weapons, just use the stats in the book, give them different names, and you're good to go, okay? The key is they're using weapons that are probably not going to be commonly known to the people around them for specialty reasons, and so that gives them an edge. So whether it's giving them an edge at the weapon that actually is Asian or giving them an edge because the weapon has a fancy name that you've given it, doesn't matter. Um, I think they did a good job presenting the ninja. Uh, nothing about it screamed at me that was uber incredible or horrible. I think it was well executed. Um, I, I kind of like the fact that they decided to use a martial class that has roguelike abilities 
as opposed to a rogue class that has martial abilities. Because I think going martial with rogue abilities is a better focus of what a ninja is to my mind. Warriors that had stealth abilities as opposed to stealth specialists that had rogue ability, had fighter abilities. Um, and we have the samurai. And the samurai is all about the orders they belong to. They are, in essence, knights. And so they have to fair swear fealty to someone, and those, those oaths they take, the orders they belong to, fuel a lot of the different abilities they have. Uh, full bab, all armor types, all weapon types, plus a number of classic weapons, the, the, the wakazashi, katana, you get the idea, you're familiar with what the samurai is. And again, I don't think you have to play them as strictly Asian. Change the name, give them different weapons that have very similar characteristics, and you could have Dwarven. Well, what Dwarven character isn't a perfect personality type for a samurai? The rigid clan structure of the Dwarven culture would be perfect for samurai. You just give them different names. Give them, instead of katanas, they have war axes or something along those lines. And I think everything in the book could easily be lifted up, moved over, and handed right to them without a hitch. Or you could say that the elves in your world are samurai. Maybe the elves are the Japanese culture. Complete. Elven is Japanese. Maybe you're running a real-world fantasy game where all of the Asian peoples are different races of elves, or one race, just different cultures of elves. Exotic flavor, and let's face it, tall, thin, black-haired elves are right out of anime, folks. They're, that's perfect for your anime-style campaigning. Um, so I think they did an excellent job with all three classes. I didn't find anything broken or, 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 or uber powerful with them. I'm sure that there are people out there who will say that both do. Uh, both extremes have been met. But, you know, some people, if you hand them a bag of money, they complain about the color of the bag. Um, then we get into different character classes and the different archetypes they can have. Now, I love Pathfinder archetypes. Pathfinder archetypes are awesome sauce. They are what I have been waiting for for years because... I have gotten really tired of prestige classes, okay? I don't like the fact that you have to take a left turn, actually, it would be a left turn, left turn from your core class just to get what you want. And you can't do it at first level. You have to wait till your fifth or sixth or seventh before you can you get to where you wanted to go. But with an archetype, you pick the right one, you have the right build, you can start from first level pursuing the path that you always wanted to pursue. How much better can that get? Um, now, I'm not going to cover all of them, but they cover all the different classes. The, the, the alchemist isn't here. There's a couple of different um, uh, alchemist traditions, you know, archetypes that you can play. Then you have things like the uh, the barbarian, the armored hulk, if you want to have a, a barbarian that's really into wearing heavy armor. Um, scarred rager, which is a perfect concept. You know, a horribly scarred individual, massive improvement to intimidation, things like that. Really uh, a, a nice idea. The Titan Mauler, all about, you know, beating the crap out of large things. Uh, the True Primitive, which is going to, like, the really down-and-out basic, you know, you're tearing things apart, you know, with your bare hands or just above your bare hands. Um, uh, the Urban Barbarian, which is not a complete out-of-the-woods concept, um, but not what I would have thought of, quite frankly. But then again, the Urban Ranger was really cool in, in Pathfinder, so... Maybe you get have, have an idea that, that 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 would be cool too. Now the bard presents you with the archaeologist and the daredevil, and for the, one of the first times I have ever considered in my head the idea of actually playing a bard. Well, wonders never cease because I really don't like bards. I'm playing my lute. Sorry, that doesn't just doesn't fit my image of a stealthy venturing party. In fact, there's one ability somewhere in the Pathfinder system where you you you're Bard is using his magical ability, it helps the party improve their stealth. What, what is he doing? Does he have, like, um, little cotton balls on the string so he doesn't make sound while he's playing? That was a stupid idea. Um, then we have the Cavalier, which has new orders to um, play. And I think a lot of ways the Samurai made me think of the Cavalier, which isn't a complete out-of-the-woods idea either because... 
the original samurai, the actual foundation of the sh of the bushido, was the way of the horse and the bow. So having a link to this to the to the cavalier in that regard, uh, and you know, with their with their structure, isn't crazy. Um, we have a beast rider, which is kind of a nice uh, concept. I thought that was kind of nice for uh, for your cavaliers, especially particularly if you're going to be running a uh, campaign where you have small cavaliers running to ride medium-sized creatures, which means they can fit into a lot of different places in, in, in your dungeons. Um, the musketeer, which fits into the gunslinger um, class, uh, borrowing abilities from it to uh, to get that kind of free musketeer thing, which is a nice bit of flavor. Um, then you have the cleric, you have the divine strategist, um, the crusader, the merciful merciful healer. The picture next to the merciful healer is like a dwarf with a big hammer in his hand. It doesn't say merciful healer to me, <laughs> but it's a cool picture. Um, then we have druid, which has a number of different new shaman types. Ape, ape shaman, bat shaman, the boar shaman, which is very um, iconic for uh, orcs. Uh, then we have the World Walker, which is con you know the whole idea of uh, having favorite terrains and things like that for your for your druid, kind of a, a barring a bit of the Rangers vibe. Um, then of course we have a whole lot of things in here, all about fighters. The Armor Master, which is becoming really good with your armor. Um, the Brawler, which is about uh, unhand uh, unarmed combat. The Cad, which I kind of like the the kind of a rakish. Foppish kind of a fighting type. Um, the Dragoon, which is, you know, uh, actually fits into that real world uh, role of the Dragoon, that, you know, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. The Gladiator, which is, uh, which is cool, particularly if your campaign uses Gladiators or your character is an ex-slave or something like that. This would be a good archetype to carry through on their character. Um, the Tactician, the Tower Shield Specialist, which I thought was kind of cool having a specialist for the tower shield itself. The tower shield has got a lot of play in, 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 in my experience, and having an ar archetype about it, I think, is really quite appropri uh, appropriate. Um, then we get into the gunslinger, and you have things like the gun tank, which is a heavily armored um, fire uh, a fighter, a gunslinger, perfect for, for dwarves, of course. Uh, the musket master, the pistolero, um, then we get the Inquis Inquisitor, and frankly, I don't like the Inquisitor class. The whole idea of being the strong arm of your faith and imposing your religious beliefs and make passing judgment upon others is really distasteful for me on a moral level. So I didn't really read a whole lot of that part. Uh, then we have the Magus, which was the class introduced in the Complete uh, Magic, which was a, a nice fighter-mage fusion. And... Uh, some new Magus Arcanas, you know, their, their class abilities that they can fuel with their character points. I can't remember what they're called. Um, then you have the Kensai. Now, the Kensai are fighters that focus fuel to, to, to fuel their magic abilities through their weapons. Now, this is interesting because the original Kensai in 3.5 was a pure fighter, or almost a pure fighter, that then got magical abilities into his weapon. Here, they're taking the class that already has the fusion of fighter and magic and focusing a little more through the weapon. Nice job, well done, very appropriate. Um, the Skurner, um, which is, I believe, um, Shield Vassal or Shield Maiden. The Skirmisher has learned to infuse his power into his shield. Again, some armor specialty, which is nice. Armor and shields don't get a lot of play in a lot of, in a lot of situations. They're accoutrement that you can attack on the people. Having class abilities that emphasize they're important, because the shield in real life was really important, folks. The shield was monumentally useful in combat. And the games, I've very rarely ever seen a game that really gave them um, the emphasis they deserve. Having a class ability that does... I think it's a nice thing. Um, then we have Monk, and the Monk has got some awesome archetypes in here. First of all, the game introduces the kind of different styles of combat. So you have different the tiger style, dragon style, monkey style, and you can have multiple styles, and you can switch from style to style, um, from, from round to round. So it very much reflects the real world different schools of Chinese martial arts in particular. Um, very, very kung fu. Um, then we also have archetypes in here like the Flowing Monk, which is all about motion and tapping into the whole water elemental concept. 
Um, the Maneuver Master, which is about switching from different styles very effectively. Uh, the Martial Artist, a non-lawful monk class that has no uh, magical abilities. It's all martial arts. It's all hard you know, training and not about being mystical. So if you've always wanted to have the, the monk's abilities, but you didn't like all the things that were tacked onto it, this book has you covered. And I can understand that. Those trappings are sometimes not very appropriate to many campaigns. This strips them away, and I think now that the martial artist would fit into many campaigns that people don't like monk in, monks in. Um, the sensei, which is all about teaching and leading people, so you get a lot of teamwork style um, abilities in there. The tetori, which is all about wrestling, and it's essentially, you know, the, 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 the sumo style of, of combat. And I read this, and I'm going... This is perfect for the dwarf. With their stability feature, you are going to make an awesome character. Um, then we have Paladin, and i got to pick this up because it's already running long. Um, the Which a number of different, uh, essentially, Paladin orders. Then we have uh, Ranger, which has a focus, for example, Battle Scout, which is a little more combat-oriented, a little less woodsy. Um, the Trophy Hunter, which is about you know hunting for... Uh, hunting animals and monsters to... to acquire um, their bits, essentially. The Wild Stalker. We have some rogues in here, features in here, and there are new uh, talents that you can take at different levels where you are allowed to take a rogue talent and that have a little more martial um, bent to them. Um, different rogue archetypes are, for example, the Bandit, Chameleon, a Driver, because the game introduces a number of different vehicle options. Um, the Pirate, because what else would, would you need except, you know, if you're a pirate rogue? And face it, now that we've got guns, Pirates of the Caribbean is here, folks. You can do it in Pathfinder with absolutely no problem. Um, and we also have a uh, wizard, like a spell, sling, a spell slinger, which is focusing your spells through a weapon, which I thought was nice. Um, then we get into a whole section on feats in here. And there are feats, I mean, the, just the, the, the brief charts is like six pages long. Okay, there's a lot of feats in this book. Um, and a lot of them play off the things in here, but there are for, for there's there's a chain of wrestling style moves in here, where it's like it's like uh, the bone breaker, and then the jaw breaker, and then the neck breaker, and if you take all these things in in, in, a, in a line one after another, and you get to the neck breaker. If you make a successful attack with this feet, feet on a character, okay, from you're gonna get them in a grapple, you do like one a two die six strength or dex bonus. Now, you go after decks. Lots of things, tough monsters don't have great decks. You do a lot of damage to them. They're paralyzed. You just crippled them. You can just leave them on the ground and walk away. How humiliating is, it, is that to leave your enemy behind knowing he's just going to die? Very iconic in my mind of, of a badass character. Um... But there just there are so many different feats in here, and some of them in, in, um, reinforce the monk style. Some are for the gunslinger. Some are for the ninja. For the samurai, and of course there are also things in here for all kinds of different um, uh, uh, martial characters. Um, so I was really quite impressed with. It. They had a lot of teamwork feats. And I gotta tell you, I'm not a big teamwork fan, feat fan. I've never really liked them a whole lot because you gotta have multiple people in the party to have the same feat to take the benefit of it. And I don't think there's enough bang for how much you, for the buck you're spending. I think that if you take a single feat, if one person in the group takes a teamwork feat, that should affect all allies in the group that are adjacent to them. So one guy can take one teamwork feat and it affects everybody who's adjacent. Another person can take a teamwork, teamwork feat and it affects everyone who's adjacent. Yeah, it makes them a little more powerful, but they're not great and overwhelming to begin with. So I don't think you're unbalancing the game by doing that. Um, but like I said, there's a huge section of uh, things in here uh, dealing with feats. Then we have a whole section on weapons and armor. Lots of Asian stuff in here because they introduced the ninja and the samurai. And I'm going to do a separate video on the weapons and the firearms that were presented in this because I do have a few beefs with them, not major ones, um, but they. Uh, but there's lots of stuff in here, lots of armor um, that would be very appropriate to an Asian culture. And again, if you're if you're if you're following the names ninja and samurai classes and using them in another 
um, style of a fantasy campaign, those armors will obviously probably not be as useful to you. Um, and they do have one here, which is siege weapons. They have all kinds of wonderful siege weapons in here. Mangonels, catapults, ballistas, trebuchets, cannons, everything. Great stuff. They have rules for dueling, if you want to do formalized dueling. Um, they have uh, base types of combat that deal with showmanship, like how to get how, how, to, how to manipulate the crowd, how to do things in a way that, perfect for gladiator combat, or if you're a dairy doing cad or, or, or um, swashbuckler of some variety. Um, then we have vehicles. Um, from the mundane carts and things to more exotic things like airships. And again, I think the game really needed to have a few things, holes plugged, and here they are, holes are plugged. Then we have some variant rules in here. And the variant rules, I'm going to go real quick over these. Armor as damage reduction, call shots, piecemeal armor, and wounds and vigor. So these four different options you can have. Um, wounds is vigor, and vigor replaces standard hit points. Not a model I happen to like, but there are people who to, who do like that. Piecemeal armor, which I think is a useful set of skills, particularly at low levels if you're picking things up as you go along. Called shots, which is a nice functional way to do called shots. Each called shot has one rating of either easy, tricky, or challenging, giving it a negative 2, negative 5, or negative 10 on your attack. Um, and then the bonuses you get for where you hit different parts of the body, where you, where you hit someone are balanced enough that they make it worth your while, but it's not going to be a complete game ender right there and then, okay? Every eye shot is just not going to instantly be a kill, okay? Um, and the armor versus damage, I I like that concept. I have heard someone complain to me that they felt that when they practiced it, they put it into play, they had a problem with it because they felt that the DR, um, the uh, all armor provides damage reduction, and it made hitting things or damaging things so hard, the only way their party was able to harm anything was to have two characters grapple them while the third guy essentially used the, his weapon as an oyster shucker to kill the guy because he was denied his, his uh, he was flat-footed essentially being grappled. Um, I think you could do away with that problem if you were to have a successful hit that does not get through DR, do a minimum of one point of damage. The death by a thousand cuts concept. And magical bonuses would add to that, but strength wouldn't. Um, so that would make magic items have a little more oomph, which isn't a bad thing. And it would mean that if you got multiple attacks in a single round against someone, you should be whittling them away. Damage reduction means damage reduction. It does not mean you are completely 100% immune from everything, in my opinion. Um, and then the last part of the, of the book is lots and lots of spells. Now, some of the spells made lots of sense. There was a spell in there like makes these little ghostly hands come out and like help you load your firearms, which was very cool if you're doing the John Woo thing. Um, but there was a spell in there, a seventh level spell that creates an arcane cannon, which has a movement of 20. You can attach spells to the cannon, uh, the cannonballs, but the cannonballs only do four die 10 and only had a 50 foot range increment. This is the same level as Limited Wish. That seemed like a real waste of a spell in my book. It seemed far too low powered for a 7th level spell. I just, why would you do that? Why would you not just fly up and lob fireballs at somebody? What is the advantage of having a cannon that fires magic cannonballs as opposed to just firing a 3rd level fireball spell? It, it just didn't, it didn't seem to be worth it to me. But, overall, I thought... Ultimate Combat was awesome. Better than Ultimate Magic. I'm biased. I've always preferred martial characters to spellcasting characters. Um, I highly recommend this if you are a fan of um, martial skills in Pathfinder. You are going to eat this thing up. You're going to be chewing on this for, for weeks. It took me a couple weeks to read through this, and it got me thinking about so many ideas. So, highly recommended. I apologize that this video went so long. It just there's a whole lot of material to cover here. Um, like I said, if you're a Pathfinder fan, go forth, buy this book.